Now, if you haven't seen the video, Real Christians Do Not Eat Pork, I really highly recommend that you go over there and watch that video. But I got this comment on this video. Talina says, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8. Food will not make us acceptable to God. We are not inferior if we don't eat, and we are not better if we do eat. And so I replied, It's great that you refer to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8. That whole chapter shows Paul's fallibility. So this person quotes from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Let's go over there and let's read it for ourselves. Paul writes to the believers in the city of Corinth, Now concerning the things sacrificed to idols, this is about the things that are sacrificed to idols. That's what this whole chapter is all about. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. But if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he doesn't yet know as he ought to know. In other words, if you really think you know something, you better uh, think again because you don't know as you ought to know. But if anyone loves God, the same is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that no idol is anything in the world, and there is no other God but one. For though there are things that are called gods, whether in the heavens or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet to us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we are for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and we live through him. However, that knowledge isn't in all men. With consciousness of the idol until now, eat as of a thing sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But food will not commend us to God, for neither if we don't eat are we the worse, nor if we eat are we the better. But be careful that by no means does this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to the weak. For if a man sees you who have knowledge sitting in an idol's temple, won't his conscience, if he is weak, be emboldened to eat things sacrificed to idols? And through your knowledge, he who is weak perishes, the brother for whose sake Christ died, thus sinning against the brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak. You sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will eat no meat forevermore that I don't cause my brother to stumble. Now, as you can see, Paul says a whole lot more than what that person said in referencing 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8. And it wasn't even in context because Paul obviously was talking about animals that were sacrificed to idols. He says absolutely nothing about animals that are deemed unclean that we can somehow eat them. He says absolutely nothing of the sort. He's talking about animals that are sacrificed to idols and the meat that can be eaten of them. Going back to this comment, I replied that person saying, it's great that you refer to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8. That whole chapter shows Paul's fallibility. Paul never claimed to be infallible. He never claimed to even be a prophet. He never claimed that every single word that he spoke was the word of the Lord. In fact, the opposite was true. I go on and say Paul was wrong in Acts when he said that lives will be lost with the ship. That was Acts chapter 27, by the way. But in truth, no lives were lost. Paul missed it. He was wrong. My point here is just in saying that not everything that Paul says is absolutely true. Now, I, Paul is a very knowledgeable individual, and we can learn a lot by reading Paul's mail here. And that is, in fact, what we're doing, okay? When you read the epistles of Paul, the word epistles is just a fancy word that means letters. We are just reading Paul's letters. We're reading Paul's mail, okay? Personal mail that he never intended to be in the Bible, okay? See, Paul never claimed to be on par with Moses. He never claimed to be on par with David. He never claimed to be on par with Isaiah. Paul is Paul, okay? He's not one of the 12. Jesus did not choose him when he walked this earth 
and did his ministry, okay? Even Paul said, I'm like a child that was born out of time. I'm like an illegitimate child, okay? I'm not even part of the 12. He admitted that. And we read all this stuff, by the way. You get people who comment on my videos and they quote passages that we've already been through. For those of you who don't know, we're going through the Bible, every single word of the Bible, okay? We're going through every single word. And we already went through 1 Corinthians chapter 8. If you really want to study it, go back to that video that was posted weeks ago. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We already went through it all, okay? So I'm just going to do this quickly. I'm not going to go through it all in depth. If you want it in depth, go back to that video. But my point here is that Paul is not perfect in everything that he says. In the book of Acts, chapter 27, he was on the ship and he said, well, I perceive that this ship will be lost and lives will be lost. People are going to die. And it says very clearly after that, that nobody died. Paul was wrong. Sometimes he gets things wrong. A lot of things that he says is awesome. It's great. You can learn from it. And we can learn a lot of things from his letters, but not everything he says is correct. We have to do what the Bereans did, what the men of Berea did in Acts chapter 17. When Paul came to Berea in Acts chapter 17, the men, they didn't say, oh, it's Paul. Everything he says is perfect. This is the word of God. Everything he says is the word of God. Everything he writes is the word of God. His message is the word of God. That's not what they said. They said, okay, Paul, we'll give you a chance. We'll listen to you. We'll hear you out. We'll hear what you have to say. But we're going to test everything you say with scripture. And let me remind you, the only scripture they had back then was the Tanakh. That's the only scripture they had. The New Testament didn't exist back then. So they didn't run what Paul said past the books of the New Testament because there was no New Testament back then and there was no Bible as we know it today. So they had the Tanakh. They had what we call the Old Testament and other documents such as what you find in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So when the men of Berea heard Paul, they said, Paul, okay, we'll hear you, but we're going to test everything you say. And we should do the same when we're reading the epistles of Paul. Remember in Acts chapter 17, the Lord didn't condemn the men of Berea for testing Paul, for, for, for being critical of Paul. The Lord didn't condemn them. Actually, the Lord liked it. It says the Lord commended them. He gave them honor for what they did. They're like, Paul, um, we're going to listen to you, but we're going to make sure we're going to test it with the Tanakh. We're going to test it with the Old Testament to make sure, Paul, what you say lines up with it. So going back to my comment, I said he was wrong in the, in the book of Acts, and indeed he was. And again here, Paul missed it when he said that it's okay to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Remember, he didn't say anything about unclean meat. Jesus clearly said the exact opposite in Revelation chapter 2, verse 14 and Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. Jesus made it very clear to the church, to his church, to his people, that he is against everyone who eats meat sacrificed to idols. Now, remember what we just read. You know, Paul wasn't against it. He's like, well, you can do it. I mean, you have the freedom in Christ to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Just don't do it so that it would, you know, cause someone else to stumble. That's all. If there's somebody else in your presence that they say, oh, that, that lamb was sacrificed to an idol. I'm not going to eat that meat. Well, then Paul says, well, don't do it. Don't eat that meat. Because if you eat that meat, you're insensitive to your brother or your sister. And you could cause them to fall into sin. And that is not the love of Christ. Romans chapter 14, he talks about the same thing. And I encourage you to go over to Romans chapter 14 and read it. Paul said, if you eat things that other people, you know, says you're not supposed to eat that would cause other people to stumble, you do not walk in the love of Christ. In fact, in the very chapter this person quoted in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul said, if you eat something that causes someone else to stumble, if you eat something that somebody else thinks is sin, you are sinning against Christ. So no matter which way you look at it, no matter how you look at it, if you think that God is okay with you eating unclean things, if you think that God is okay with you disobeying the eternal word of God that was brought down through us in Leviticus chapter 11, if you think God's okay with that, if you think that we as Christians have the freedom to eat pork now, if you're right, let's just say, just give you the benefit of the doubt, okay? We'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Let's just say you're right. We have the freedom to eat pork now, okay? If we do, 
then you still are not supposed to eat pork according to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. The very same chapter that Talina quoted to try to prove that you can eat pork actually in all implications tells you that you should not eat pork if anybody stumbles because of it. If you spend any amount of time any considerable amount of time preaching the gospel to Jews or to Muslims, you will always find that they will bring that up. They will say, oh, you're a Christian, are you? Well, you're a pig eater. So, I mean, you are, you eat pork when the Bible says not to eat pork. There is a stumbling block. I guarantee you there are lots of Jews, lots of Muslims that are hung up on that point. And if Christians would just obey 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and just sacrifice don't even don't eat it don't eat pork just for that reason alone don't eat it because you can put a stumbling block in the way of jews or muslims to come to the lord no matter which way you look at it you should not eat pork if you're a christian if you do you are disobeying god no matter which way you look at it the fact of the matter is there are a lot of people that are hung up on that just that one point and if christians say hey you know what? I don't eat pork because I believe the Bible. I go by the words of God. I go by the eternal word of God. If Christians just obey that, if Christians just did that, I mean, you would disarm a lot of the objections to Christianity and to the practice of modern day corrupt Christianity. And lots of people would come to the knowledge of the truth. And lots of people would come to the Lord. So my point was this in my comment, that 1 Corinthians chapter 8 is about eating meat sacrificed to idols. Paul says absolutely nothing about eating unclean meat, okay? And that Paul does get it wrong sometimes. He did in the book of Acts and he did here because obviously turn over to Revelation chapter 2 and read the word of the Lord, the words in red, the words of Jesus rule. The words of Jesus have the ultimate authority here, okay? Jesus said, I have this against you that you eat meat sacrificed to idols. Contrary to what Paul said, that it's okay to eat meat sacrificed to idols. So let's see what Talina said in reply. She said, so you are saying the Bible, the word of God is wrong? I am sorry now, I can't believe anything you say anymore. Then you could also say that the whole gospel, the whole gospel is not right because the evangelist did not write the truth. No, we are not to throw out the baby with the bathwater, okay? Like I said, it is very clear that not everything that Paul said is the word of the Lord. Even Paul said that. Listen, Talina, I believe the Bible just as much, if not more, than you. Because I believe what the Bible says about itself. The very same book that you tried quoting against me, the very same book, 1 Corinthians, the previous chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul made it very clear. What I say here, at least in that portion, he says, what I say here is not the commandment of the Lord. I don't have a word of the Lord in, in regards to this. What I say here is my own judgment, it's my own opinion, it's my own perception. Very clearly, Paul said that what he says is not the word of the Lord. Not to say that it's wrong. I'm not saying that it's wrong, okay? I'm not saying throw it out because it's not the word of the Lord because if that's the case, you'd have to throw out 99.9999999% of everything you read. But Paul made it very clear that he is not always writing the word of the Lord. How many times did Paul actually say, thus saith the Lord in quotation marks? How many times? What is the word of God? It's what God says. It's actually the words out of God's mouth. Not the words out of Paul's mouth, not the words out of Job's mouth, not the words out of Judas's mouth, not the words out of Mary's mouth, it's the words out of God's mouth. Put it this way, John meets Mary. John says, hi Mary, how you doing? Mary says, I'm fine, thank you, how are you? What's the word of John? I'm fine, thank you, how are you? Is that the word of John? No, that's the word of Mary, that's what Mary said. The word of John is what John said, in quotations. The word of Mary is what Mary said, in quotations. The word of God is what he said. Every time the Bible says, thus saith the Lord, or God spoke and said, or God said, that is the word of the Lord. 
When Paul writes and says, I, Paul, that's the word of Paul. Does Paul include the word of God in his epistles? Yeah, he does. He includes the word of God in his epistles, but not everything he writes is the word of God. Even he said that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He said it. The Bible says it. I believe it. That makes me more of a believer in the Bible than people who say every single word of the Bible is the word of God. If you think that every single word of the Bible is the God's word for you, without exception, then guess what? I mean, turn to the end of Romans. Turn to the end of uh, 1 Timothy, where Paul says, you know, go to Aquilus, go, go to their household, go to uh, Aquilus and Priscilla and greet them, say hi to Lois, uh, go to the household of Stephanus and, 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 and do this and do that. Is that God's word for you? If it is, you better go find Aquila and Priscilla. You better go find Stephanus. You better go find your grandmother Lois. It's not God's word for you today. Not everything is. There is a lot of good stuff that Paul said that you can learn from. Yes, 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 we can learn from a lot of things that Paul said. And there's a lot of awesome things he said, but not everything is the word of the Lord. So Talina says, does that mean you can just throw out all the Gospels because you could say, well, the, the evangelists who wrote the Gospels didn't uh, tell the truth? No, not at all. Again, you got to look at the books that you read in the Bible. By the way, the Bible, is, a lot of people think it's one book. It's actually a library of books. I'm not talking about versions of the Bible, but there are a lot of different compilations of the Bible. There are Bibles that have the Apocrypha in it and Bibles that don't. In fact, a lot of people, I know they're King James only people, you know, they don't realize that the Apocrypha was originally in the original real King James Version back in 1611 and was kept in the King James Version for hundreds of years. Do you realize that there are at least a dozen different Bible canons? And again, I'm not talking about different Bible translations, not at all. Don't get me wrong. I'm talking about different Bible canons, different compilations, different books that are included in the Bible. The modern day Protestant Bible, which is by the way, a whole lot different than most of the history of Protestantism up until now. They had the Apocrypha in it, by the way. And by the way, there is different, different Apocryphas as well. You know, this particular Bible from this church, from this denomination, from this uh, part of Christianity, and contains this kind of apocrypha. This other one contains another kind of apocrypha that has more books in it. Another church that has tens of millions of followers has a different set of books in them. So again, you've got to look at this objectively, okay? In the days of Jesus, there was no Bible. There was no Bible at all, okay? And Jesus had no problem with it. He could have. He had lots of opportunity to say, well, guys, you know what? Part of our mission is to actually compile the Bible. I want to speak to you guys about what books should be in the Bible and what books should not be in the Bible. He could have wrote a book himself. He could have, you know, give us a authentic canon himself. He wasn't interested in that. In his day, in Jesus' day, the books of the Bible were actually scrolls that were kept in separate places. Why were they kept separately? to maintain their individuality. Remember Luke chapter four, when, when Jesus got up to speak and when he got up to read from the Tanakh, that says they handed him the scroll of Isaiah. It doesn't say they handed him the Holy Bible. They handed him the scroll of Isaiah. And by the way, the scroll of Isaiah was kept separate from the scroll of the Torah because the scroll of Torah has a different place in hierarchy of scripture, okay? The scroll of the Torah was held in much greater esteem, venerated much greater than let's say the scroll of Esther was, okay? So nowadays when we got the whole entire Bible all in one book nowadays, it's like the only pro to that is that it's all convenient. The con is, it makes it look like everything is equal when it's not. We need to maintain, we need to bring back within our own minds and our own understanding a more dynamic view of Scripture, a dynamic view of the authority of Scripture. That's why it's called the Tanakh, Torah first, Nevi'im prophets second, and then the writings after that, the historical writings and such, okay? That is why there's a specific order to that. When we read the Gospels, we need to read it for what it really is. There are four different books written by four different people 
and around the same time, but at different times, okay? And I have argued with people before in the past about discrepancies in the Gospels, okay? They say, oh, there's the, all these discrepancies, you know, in the Gospels that Matthew says two people were healed and when Luke said it was only one blind man, Matthew said two. There are so many discrepancies you can find in the Gospels. And you know what? I am not disputing that. In fact, the discrepancies in the Gospels make it much more believable. It is much more real. Put it this way. You got to look at it for what it really is. You got to understand what the Bible is and what the books that you're reading really are. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are ancient biographies written by four different men, okay? Ancient biographies. They never claimed to be perfect in all they wrote. They were just like, as in almost today, you got four different media agencies. You got four different news agencies all reporting on the same event. If you've got four different news agencies today, and let's say a huge event happens, okay? Something major happens in the world. And you got four of the biggest news people going in, you know, four of the new biggest news companies going in to cover the story. I guarantee if you examine it, it, you're gonna find discrepancies. Okay? It's just the way it is. That's just natural. That's just normal. If you have a trial in a courtroom and you have four different witnesses, if all of the witnesses say exactly the same thing and all of their words match up exactly the same way, I tell you something, the jury and the judge is gonna look and say, this is a conspiracy. This is this is too good to be true. They must have met together before and they must have got their story straight. They must have colluded together because nobody always agrees with everything. Even eyewitnesses. When the Titanic sank, okay, there were many eyewitnesses on the scene. Even the eyewitnesses had discrepancies amongst themselves. Eyewitnesses, that is. That's not just you know, biographers or people reporting on an event that happened. That's eyewitnesses, okay? One person says, this song was the last song that was sung. Another person said, no, it wasn't that song, it was the other song. So they fight. One person said, the Titanic broke in half. The other one said, no, it didn't. I saw it, I was there. I'm an eyewitness, it didn't break in half. And on and on it goes. Even the media of that day kept on reporting different numbers of how many people actually died, okay? And even, actually, even to this day, we don't really know the exact number, okay? The exact number is disputable of how many people actually died on the Titanic. So just because you've got eyewitnesses that disagree and have discrepancies amongst themselves, does that mean you throw out the whole story? Does that mean you say, oh no, the Titanic didn't sink at all. It's all just a hoax. Why? Because, well, they disagree on what the last song was. Well, they disagree on whether or not the Titanic actually broke in half. No, the whole world knew and the whole world believed that the Titanic actually sunk. Because even amongst their discrepancies, even amongst what they disagreed on, they still all agreed that the Titanic sank. And still, with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, even if there are discrepancies about, well, there's two blind men over here and only one over here. Well, the thieves on the cross did this. Well, the, another one says, no, they didn't do that. Well, you know what? Regardless of the little discrepancies, that's all they are. Minor, minor discrepancies. Still, the main story holds true. Jesus was the Son of God. He died. He was crucified. And he rose again. They all agree on that. So I continue what Talina said here. What did Jesus say in Mark chapter 7, verse 15 to 23? Amongst all the four Gospels, Mark is the most troubled. What I mean by troubled is there are so many variations in the original manuscripts in the Gospel of Mark, okay? So many variations. And there are different places in the book of Mark where it says things that obviously contradict the rest of scripture. Mark chapter seven, verse 15, right here. There is nothing from outside of the man that going into him can defile him. But the things which proceed out of the man are those that defile him. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. That particular verse talking about variations in the original manuscripts, that particular verse right there, verse 16, there's another point of variation right there. 
Verse 17, when he had entered into a house away from the multitude, his disciples asked him about the parable. What parable is that? Jesus and his disciples came into this house and they didn't wash their hands. Okay, so their hands were a little bit dirty. They didn't wash their hands. You know, they picked up maybe some matzah and started eating it or that kind of thing. And the Pharisees are like, oh, wait a second. You didn't wash your hands? Well, according to the tradition of the elders, you're supposed to wash your hands. Notice, if you read earlier uh, in this same chapter, again, this person doesn't really put it into context. But if you read earlier, uh, it says that the Pharisees accused him of breaking tradition, not Torah. Because Torah doesn't say anything about having to wash your hands before eating. And so the Pharisees asked Jesus, why didn't you wash your hands? Why didn't you hold to the tradition of the elders? And Jesus said, well, you know, it's not this little bit of dirt that goes in your mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out of your mouth. All of the, you know, all of the filth that comes out of your mouth, that is what defiles you. In other words, here again, you're straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. The little bit of dust, a little bit of dirt that goes in your mouth is the gnat. The camel is the, actually what comes out of your mouth. It's what defiles you. And so you see, the disciples had issue with what Jesus said about the, the little bit of dirt that goes in your mouth. They were wondering, huh, I mean, what about this? Uh, you know, because, I mean, it, it kind of shocked them that Jesus would say such a thing. So Jesus said to them, are you also without understanding? Don't you perceive that whatever goes into the man from outside can't defile him? Because it doesn't go into his heart, doesn't go into his spirit, but into his stomach, then into the latrine, making all foods clean. Now, it says here the NU manuscripts ends Jesus' direct quote and question after latrine, ending the verse with, thus he declared all foods clean. So in some of the most popular translations of the Bible, you will see that the words making all foods clean are in brackets. They are not the words in red. They are not the words of Jesus, but something that was added later by a lot of people don't even know who exactly wrote the book of Mark. So you should not stake your soul upon a book that has so many different variations that thus in turn become so many different discrepancies against other parts of the scripture. We should take the whole entire scope of scripture into context. I want to end with two points, okay? But to draw a little bit of a picture, to paint a little bit of a picture here, a lot of people, they quote, you know, in Acts when Peter had that vision, you know, of, of unclean animals being led down on a sheet and God said, kill and eat. And Peter said right away, no, no way, Lord, am I going to kill and eat those unclean things? You know, it's, I, it's, I'm not supposed to do that. And God said, don't say it's unclean when I have made them clean. Now, obviously, if you read that in context, that is not talking about literal food. That is talking about people. It is very clear there, okay, in the book of Acts. It's talking about the Gentiles. In fact, in the Jewish mind, the Gentiles were animals. They're unclean animals, okay? That's why Jesus called Herod a fox. That's why Jesus called that Syrophoenician woman a dog, okay? Because they are considered to be unclean animals. And that precept precipitates there in the book of Acts with Peter's vision. It's very clear. It has nothing to do with eating pork, okay? If it did, then Peter would say, oh yeah, man, I can eat pork now. He would go eat pork. And if he actually did that, you know, a lot of Christians, they have no clue. They don't clue in what would happen. What would happen if Peter actually went and ate pork? What would, he, what would happen if he actually went back to the disciples and said, oh, guess what? The Lord showed me, let's go and let's kill some pigs and let's have some bacon and ham because the Lord said we can do that now. If he actually did that, it would cause a riot, okay? I mean, he would be arrested, he would be drugged before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish court, and he would be charged, okay? That didn't happen because it is very clear that that is not what God meant. God did not mean for Peter to go have some lobster and pork, okay? That's not what God meant. Reading it in context, it meant that God took the unclean animals, the Gentiles, and cleaned them up, called them, saved them, sanctified them. So point number one is this. If that's true, that Jesus actually taught that it's okay to eat unclean animals, Obviously, Peter was there, and Peter was one of the closest disciples of Jesus. I mean, amongst all the 12, Peter, James, and John, they were the closest ones. They were there, they were right there with the Lord all the time, okay? They were the ones that were 
they would, if there's anybody that would hear, if it was anybody that would know, it would be them, okay? Why is it? When God said, kill and eat, Peter said, clearly, surely not. I have never touched an unclean thing. I've never eaten anything unclean in my life. Certainly not. I would never do that. Why would Peter say that if Jesus taught the opposite? It's because Jesus did not teach the opposite. He did not teach against the law of his father. And the unknown contributor in the book of Mark chapter seven that said making all foods clean was wrong. That was not the words of our Lord. And number two, the final point. If Jesus really taught that it's okay to eat unclean animals now, it's like, well, you know, you know, that, that whole stipulation in the Torah, you know, Leviticus chapter 11, let's just, you know, I'm just going to take it out, okay? I, I, we'll just uh, subtract that from your, from your requirements now. If Jesus actually did that, he is violating the Torah because Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2 and Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 32, God said very clearly, do not add to this law and do not diminish from it. Do not take anything from it. And if Jesus did, if he did, then he is violating the law. He is transgressing the law, which makes him a sinner, which automatically disqualifies him from being the Messiah, automatically disqualifies him from being the sinless, spotless lamb. It's absolutely impossible. No wonder so many Jews are against Christianity because of nonsense like this. No wonder so many Muslims get hung up against Christianity because of nonsense like this. And finally, let's conclude with the last things that Talina said in her comment. Pork and meat sacrificed to idols is not the same. <laughs> I know that very much so. If I eat a piece of pork, then that does not mean I eat meat that got sacrificed to idols. Yes, absolutely. I know that. That's not at all what I was talking about. Maybe pork once got sacrificed to an idol, but the pork I am eating did not. Not every piece of pork is the same. I implore you, Talina, to stop eating pork and get out there and be a good witness for the Lord. Do what Jesus would do. Remember WWJD, what would Jesus do? Jesus wouldn't eat pork because he would obey his father. He would obey the dietary laws of God. He would obey, he would not transgress because he's not a transgressor of the law. He's not a sinner. He is holy, he is righteous, and he is our example to follow. That is what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to take his example. Don't eat pork. So in the future, the next time a Jew or a Muslim or anybody else for that matter asks you the question, well, do you eat pigs? You can say truly, no, I don't because I obey God. Because eating pork is against the law of God in more ways than one. Not just the dietary laws that we read about in the book of Leviticus, but it's also against the principles that Paul taught us about. Don't eat meat. He, Paul said, I would rather not eat meat at all. I would rather be a vegetarian if, if someone is offended by what I'm eating. So Christian, obey God. Don't sin against Christ by eating pigs. Until next time, seek him with all your heart. And if you do, you will find him. Call upon him and he will show you great and mighty things. Love you guys.